When's the last time you heard someone say, that team is cursed, they'll never win a championship? Have you ever heard, well, that family's cursed. I've never seen so many evil things happen to that family in my life. That, they're, they're cursed, they're cursed. A lot of people talk about that word cursed. And uh, some Christians, unfortunately, have a little fear of that word, and you should have no fear of the word cursed. Some people treat like it's the devil's playground and God has no power over it. Well, that's not true. Even if someone cursed you to the face, I don't care who they are, a warlock, a witch, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says this, and why don't you read it with me, please? Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Amen. You believe that? They can curse you all they want. And how many know in these last days, it's going to move from the news media cursing us Christians to your neighbors and other people. Persecution is coming, you know. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And everyone cursed out Moses, or uh, Noah, I'm sorry, Noah. They all cursed him. Crazy man, building a boat. Never been rain on the earth before the flood. You know that, right? There was no such thing as rain on the earth before the flood. And what does crazy Noah do? Builds a boat. <laughs> Well, don't be upset when they think you're crazy because you're a Christian Christ follower, because you have conservative values. Well, we're going to talk about curse today, and we're going to talk about the devil's curses you don't need to worry about, but God's curses, well, now we got a problem. We got a problem. And we're going to talk about, from Deuteronomy 21, understanding cursed by God. Now, we've been reading through the Bible, and we're coming up to Joshua. In fact, the next few weeks, I'm going to do a series on parenting. I like to do a series on parenting every couple of years. Uh, so we're going to do that coming up. But today, we're going to talk about cursed by God. And why don't you stand up? We're going to read the scripture from Deuteronomy 21. And we're going to try to understand what this cursed means. So God gives Moses the revelation in Deuteronomy 21, and he says, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you, ha you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, because if you don't bury him that day, the land which you live in will become what? Defiled. Interesting. Do you think the United States of America could be defiled because we're going against some of the principles of God? I'm talking about the land, our nation. Do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is what? A curse by God. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray, Lord God, that you will be with us as we get into your word. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would help us not to fear cursed, but, Lord, to help us understand what it truly is, and know that Christ has redeemed us from the curse. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You may be seated, please. Does anyone remember the first curse that happened in the Bible? In the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden. You remember? Let me give you a little background. God was very liberal in his generosity and his goodness to Adam and Eve. And God said this, of, and I'm adding a little, 
of the tens of thousands of fruit trees I have put in the garden, you may eat of all the thousands and tens of thousands of fruit trees except one in the middle of the garden. You shall not eat of that tree, for in the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. You with me? And there are two trees in the garden. There is a tree of life, and there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Christians today still have to choose which tree to live by. We are to be uh, led by the Spirit, for Romans 8 says, For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of what? Of the flesh. But there are some Christians that prefer to walk by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We call them gossips, slanderers. Oh, I just got to know the good and the evil about sister so-and-so. So I can pray. One of the seven abominations is someone who sows discord among the brothers. Don't you think that a gossip is not connected to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? It still is. You don't live by the knowledge of other people and gossip. You live by the Spirit. Amen? Very important you get that. Adam and Eve is not the only people that are still screwing up, choosing the wrong tree to live by. And when you do that, there's a curse. There's a curse. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, why did God give the tree of knowledge of good and evil? The same reason he gives you an opportunity to open your mouth and gossip. It's called free will. Free will. You can choose to serve God or you can choose not to serve God because I'll tell you one thing, no one will be in heaven who's forced to be in heaven. No one is forced to serve God. It's a choice. And that's why God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil there. And so he still gives us that free will today. And it's important that we understand that. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died. And you may say, I don't understand, what's the big thing? Well, when Adam and Eve's spirit died, they were broken in their fellowship with God. See, you are not a body. You are a spirit being. You possess a soul of intellect, will, and emotion, and you live in an earthly body that is not made for Mars, Jupiter, Venus, or Pluto. Are you with me? This is, you are not a body. You are a spirit being. You possess a soul and you manifest through a body. When we get to heaven, we will have heavenly bodies, right? New bodies in heaven. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died and they lost fellowship with God. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, here's the scripture that Jesus said in John 4, 23, 24. Our spirit is dead. And Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is... When the true worshipers will worship the Father in what? And in truth. Now, how many know if you don't have a spirit, how can you worship God in a spirit? And then verse 24. For God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in the body. Does it say that? In the mind. Does it say that? In the emotions. Does it say that? How do you worship God? in spirit and in truth. So this is what Christianity is. Christianity is believing that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross to forgive us our sins. And when we believe what he did for us, we are called born again. Now, is our bodies born again? No. Are our souls born again? No, but we can renew them, right? Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that you may do it. So what is born again? Our spirits that died through Adam. When you are born again, your spirit is regenerated. Titus 3, 5, and 6. 
You're not saved by works of righteousness, by doing good deeds, but you're saved by the washing of regeneration, that is the word of God, and by the renewal of the spirit. Your spirit is renewed. So you with me? When you become born again, your spirit is resurrected. And now you can have a relationship and you can worship who? God. Because God is spirit. And they that worship him must, don't forget that, must worship him. You don't get to choose how you want to worship God. You worship God the way he chooses. And he made you a spirit being. So let's get into this a little bit and let's talk about these things. Uh, about the curse. Number one, what really is a curse to a Christian? A curse is a consequence of wrong action. Did Adam and Eve commit a wrong action? Yes. They partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? In the day you eat of it, the consequences is that you will die. Now, did they die physically? No. They lived over 900 years old. But they died what? They died spiritually. Now, let's get into this a little bit. Let's talk about the different curses that came upon Adam and Eve, us, earth, creation, and everything else today. So let's get into this, okay? So the Lord God commanded man, saying in Genesis chapter 2, of every tree of the garden, thousands, tens of thousands of trees he made. You may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you're going to be cursed. But you don't have to be cursed if you choose what? Wisely. You see, your decisions determine your destiny. And if you decide wisely, you can be blessed. Amen? If you decide poorly, there are consequences... And it's unwise to say, God, why are you making me suffer these consequences for my choices? But isn't that what we humans do? God is not fair. God is not fair. All these people are starving. Are you helping with the poor? No, but God is not fair. <laughs> it is unwise to blame God for our choices. Now, let's get into the curses. The first curse is the curse of the serpent. You remember? God come into the garden. Remember? They had the Shekinah glory of God. They were naked, but they were covered with God's glory. You remember in the Old Testament, the, the presence of God was a cloud by day, like a cumulus cloud above the tabernacle, and it was a fire by what? By night. Adam and Eve were completely naked and they had the Shekinah glory cloud upon their bodies. When they sinned, guess what happened? That disappeared. And they ran and they said, we're naked. Remember God said, who told you that you're naked? And then here we go, the blame game, remember? That woman, <laughs> you should have left her out of the creation. <laughs> that woman and then god said is this true eve and eve said that serpent deceived me and by the time he got to the serpent the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on <laughs> first curse is the snakes and it's interesting even after jesus died on the cross women are still afraid of snakes today there is just an enmity against women and snakes. I heard one of my sister-in-laws was in Florida and she screamed and ran out of the house yesterday because they found a snake on the back, a black snake. I think it was a black snake in Florida. But women, they hate snakes. The second thing that happened from Adam and Eve, all right, is that the creation was cursed. The serpent is cursed above the cattle, but the cattle will be cursed, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish in the sea, the reptiles. Every part of creation was cursed. You with me? The second curse, women in 
childbearing. The third curse you may not know of, this is why pastor preaches on marriage, it's called the marriage is cursed. Now this is a terrible translation, so I'm going to explain it to you. The scripture is in Genesis 3.16, wives, your desire will be for your husbands, but he will rule over you. It doesn't make sense. Well, if you understand that word desire means usurp, there was no position of authority of the woman and the man before the fall. They were equal. But after the fall, man is put upon woman in a marriage. Okay, get that right, guys. <laughs> Your wife is below you in position, in position of authority. It doesn't make you better than them. You with me? And so women say, well, I'm not going to marry any man I submit to. Well, here's a thought. Why don't you marry a man that loves you so much that you would submit to him? It's amazing what you say under the anointing sometimes, huh? <laughs> if you're so afraid of submitting to a man you may marry, find someone who loves you so much that you could trust them. You with me? Now, that word desire means to control. A woman, part of the curse, she's going to try to seize control of her husband's authority, which is above her. It's not hers. But she's going to do it by force. She's going to do it without biblical, godly rights. She's going to try to wear the pants. And yet he won't think highly of it. And he will try to what? Fight back and rule over. That's the curse that happened in the marriage. That's why today, the best marriage is made up of three. Christ the husband and the wife. And the closer the husband and wife get to Christ, guess what? The sweeter the marriage is. You with me? Very important that we understand that. So, let's go on. The fourth curse from the garden that man brought upon himself is that the whole earth was cursed with produce. Every fruit tree, every vegetation, every flower, every carnation, every beautiful thing that sprouts up from the ground was cursed. And the earth still moans today. You know, there was no earthquakes before the fall. Earthquakes is the earth moaning for redemption. Very interesting. It cries out, just like we cry out. Creation cries out. And then the fifth curse. Women, just because you think it's not fair, i got to give birth to these painful babies. The fifth curse is upon man's work. Man would have a hard time enjoying work. From the sweat of your brows in thorns and thistles you shall labor. You with me? So that's another part of it. Right here, by the sweat of your brows... You shall eat food. And then let's go on to the sixth curse. Spiritual death, I told you that. For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And where does that eternal life come from? Spirit. The Spirit comes into us and our spirit is born again. And then... The second part of the death is physical death. Adam lived till he was 900 some years old. And Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, reincarnation? The judgment. There's no reincarnation. I had to tell you a funny story. When I was in third grade, my teacher, Mrs. Burdeen, said, I was a clown in my former life. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder what I was. So I went home. I said, Mom, what was I in my former life? And she said, what? <laughs> what are they teaching you? <laughs> you see how impressionable the, the mind can be. 
never forgot that. You were a clown, and now you're a teacher. That's funny, you know. <laughs> Anyways, get back to my notes here. So, we are all under a curse because of our father and mother, Adam and Eve, correct? But look at this verse in Galatians 3.13. Please read it with me. This is so important. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, we should have hung on a tree for our sin, but Jesus took our place on the cross. That's called propitiation. It means he substituted himself for us. He took our curse and our consequence of sin so we didn't have to. Isn't that beautiful? Which means, men, our work can be redeemed. We have to pray, but we can be redeemed. The marriage can be redeemed. Not easy. It can be redeemed. You with me? Very important you understand that. Uh, over in Israel, it's amazing how they're redeeming the devil. You know, back in 48, when they gave the Jews all the land uh, in Palestine, it was all desert. And if you've ever seen pictures of it right, lately, it's beautiful. Some parts of it look like the Garden of Eden with irrigation. They're redeeming the desert. It's just, it's amazing what they're doing. And so you need to understand what the Bible says. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. A curse is the inevitable consequences of a poor choice. So when you say, I'm cursed, you say, no, no, what you're saying is you are making wrong choices. You don't have to make wrong choices. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your what? You know what that really means? He directs your feet. Where are you going? If you pray about these things. And so it's important that we understand that with the curse. Now, let's talk about this a little bit because we, you need to know one of the things a pastor teaches here is the law of the harvest. And you may not be a farmer. Some of you grew up in a farm, but there's a law, a physical law and a spiritual law called the law of the harvest. And the law of the harvest not only works in the farm, it works in your Christian life. Now, what is the law of the harvest? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the Spirit, good things, you will reap good things. If you sow to the flesh, bad things, you will reap bad things. Now, there are four principles in the law of the harvest. Follow me, please. Principle number one. You reap what you sow. If you put a kernel of wheat in the ground, an apple tree will not come up, right? You reap more than what you sow. If you put an apple seed in the ground, it will produce a tree of apples. You produce more than what you sow. You produce in kind of what you sow. If you are a, if you are a malicious gossip, and you stab people in the back with gossip at work, you're going to reap that back. It works for the good. It works for the evil. And then lastly, but most importantly, you reap in a different season than you sow. The corn farmer does not plant the corn in March and dig it up to a harvest in May. When do they dig it up? In the fall. The law of the harvest is you reap different season than when you sow. And so when someone goes out and foolishly commits adultery on their spouse and says, ah, oh, I went to church right after and God did not strike me dead. I guess I got away with it. Law of the harvest. You reap in a different season than when you sowed. You with me? And it's for good and it's for evil. So let me um, go.
go to the next scripture here. Sin takes that which is good and makes it painful. It's really what a curse is. Something that is good and you make it painful. So let's go back to the law of the harvest. You cannot sow jealousy and reap very good relationships. You with me? You cannot sow wicked thoughts and have a stable, pure mind. You cannot sow crooked business practices and expect to keep good customers, repeat customers. You with me? You cannot sow disloyalty and expect your best friends to be loyal to you. You cannot, listen to me kids, you cannot sow disrespect to your parents and then expect God's favor upon you. <laughs> can't do that. You can't sow cruelty to the different people at school that just don't fit in and expect to reap kindness in life. You don't sow greed and reap generous friends. You don't sow neglect to the Bible and expect to live a prosperous, godly life. It's the law of harvest. You reap what you sow, you reap in kind of what you sow, you reap more than what you sow, and you reap in a different season than what you sow. Now, Let's get into this. Someone said, I don't know if this is true or not, but someone said a thorn, it was a gardener, a thorn is a undeveloped blossom. Anyone ever hear that? A thorn, is, it's a beautiful, if it's true, it's a beautiful picture. A thorn is an undeveloped blossom. Why is it a beautiful picture? Because sin takes that which is good and it makes it what? And if a thorn was supposed to be a beautiful rose, and yet it's undeveloped, what does it become in our life? Pain. Pain. Very important. Now, I just, my wife and I, a couple weeks back, my, uh, my nephew, my oldest brother's oldest son, just got married in Vegas. So we were out in Vegas. And uh, Vegas, if you've been there, it's what? <laughs> It's desert. It's, now, they're, they're trying to develop it and, and bring grass, but they brought down all their water supply a foot. So now they're all worried. But if you've ever been to a desert, a desert is a beautiful picture of the curse of sin because there was no desert in God's original creation. It was something good, and through sin, it became something painful. I mean, you can die in the desert. You run out of water and other things. And so it's, a, it's kind of a neat picture. Now, with our salvation in Jesus Christ, when Jesus went to the cross, they put something on his head. What do they put on his head? Does anyone remember? A crown of thorns. And what did that crown of thorns represent? The curse where God did something good and he created Adam and Eve and they made a wrong choice and that which was intended to be good became evil. Let me give you uh, some things that are good that can become evil. Marriage is intended to be good. Yeah, how many of you know some divorces, they can be pretty bad. They can be kind of evil. Sexuality that God created is to be something beautiful in the confines of a marriage, to continue the family to go down and to teach your children. But today, in our nation, boy, are they screwing up sexuality. How many remember when you were in school, the birds and the bees? Well, now, they teach the birds want to be the bees, and the bees want to be the birds, and the birds want to dress and look up like the bees, but the bees don't want that, and... I mean, talk about confusion. <laughs> and then you've got to have the right birds, linguo, and then you have to have the right bees, linguo, and if you don't, you could get written up at work. <laughs> That's something beautiful, sexuality, and when you throw sin in it, what does it do? You're with me. And it can become a curse. 
In fact, I believe it's becoming a curse on this nation today. We as a church, we do not hate homosexuals, but we don't believe in that practice. We believe it's one man, one woman in the confines of marriage. We don't hate lesbians, but we don't believe in that. We don't hate transgenders, but we don't believe that's God's highest design. And you know, the highest suicide rate today among the confused people are those transgenders. Isn't that sad? And who's teaching them? My third grade teacher, that's what's teaching them. Crazy. It's a miracle I'm here today. <laughs> Not in the circus or something. <laughs> Well, that's what a curse does. And Jesus Christ took the curse. He took your curse, my curse, because of our sin. And he put it on his head so you and I wouldn't have to take it on our head. Now, when I was young, I used to get in trouble a lot. You know, I, my brother would think it, my second brother would say it, and then I would do it, and I would get spanked for it. That's kind of the way it was. And so my dad would always say this verse to me, Polly, Polly, be sure your sin will what? <laughs> Find you out. Well, that's the, it's not really a curse, but when you're young and you get spanked a lot, you say, that's a curse. I can't sin and not get away with it. Well, it's not a curse. It's a consequence of a wrong choice. And what my dad was saying is, you can leave the house and you can do all you want with your friends and behind the stores, and, but I may not be seeing you, but your sin, if you sin, it will come around. The law of the harvest. What goes around? And so God was saying to Moses, to say to the people, if you do not, you can put obey me, if you do not do so and obey me, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord. That choice of a sin against the Lord will bring a consequence for you can be sure your sin will come around and find you out. I'm so glad it did. I'm glad it did. But... Uh, Kids, young people, you can hide things from mom and dad and sneak, and they may not see it, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back, and it comes back because God doesn't want you to live the cursed life of wrong choices. He wants you to live the blessed life. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, and life what? More abundantly. Now, this is the scripture. A lot of people, before they come to know Jesus Christ, they fear death because they just don't understand because of teaching in our schools of evolution and all this other stuff. You know, what happens after we die? You know, and for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's in the spirit. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you know why Adam and Eve could not partake of the tree of life after they sinned? Do you know what the tree of life represented? Eternal life. And you know why God put the two cherubim angels to guard them from not getting back in? It wasn't because he hated Adam. It's because he loved Adam and Eve. If they would have partaken of the tree of life, of eternal life in their sinful state, could they ever be saved? You with me? Even in God's judgment, he's merciful. He's very merciful. I think of the scripture in Hebrews, I think it's 2.19. Uh, uh, for as much as we have partaken of flesh and blood, uh, Jesus Christ himself also took uh, flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and release us through fear of death all our lifetime were subject to bondage. Every one of us is subject to the bondage of fear of dying, fear of dying, fear of dying, fear of dying. But in Christ Jesus, we don't need to fear that. Because we know where we're going. Amen? We know Christ took away the curse on our lives. We're all sinners. We all were cursed. And when we receive Jesus Christ, 
we accept that he took the crown of thorns, the curse on himself. He went to the cross. Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. He took your curse. He took my curse. And now I'm no longer cursed. I'm blessed. Amen? Amen. Blessed. And I'm blessed to be a blessing. In fact, the scripture says this. Oh, death, where is your what? This is talking to us Christians who have been born again. Our spirits have been born again. And Christ has taken off us the curse. So now, when we're dying, we're not afraid. Where's your sting? Oh, Hades, which is another word for hell. Where is your victory? For the sting of death is what? What's the consequences of sin? Death. For the wages of sin is death. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, hallelujah, who gives us victory through who? Who took our curse, who bore our sins on the cross. Isn't that beautiful? So that's important that we understand that and that we don't have to be afraid of it. Now, let me wrap this up and let's prepare our hearts for communion. Adam and Eve could not fellowship with God because they sinned and their, the curse came upon them. Their spirit died. But God still loved them enough to keep them away from the tree of life because he wanted eventual salvation of their spirits to be born again so he could have fellowship, as we have today, amen, in the New, in the new Covenant. So when we don't know Christ, we are still walking, you're in one of two categories. You're either cursed still because you have not accepted Christ, and you are following the consequences of your sin, or you are redeemed from the curse, amen? Those are the only two camps. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. No longer cursed. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Isn't that beautiful? A second one, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. That means uncursed. Righteousness means a right standing. So here's Jesus, here's you. Here's Jesus, here's you. You're the sinner. Jesus is not the sinner. And God took your sin and he put it on Christ. And then he took Christ's righteousness and he put it on you. And that's the substitution. That's the transfer. Isn't that beautiful? And now we're a new creation. And so you have to ask yourself, you're in one of two camps. Am I in the cursed camp or am I in the redeemed camp? That's why we sing in this church. Amen? We sing because we rejoice at what he's done. And if we don't go up in the rapture, if this world does get worse and worse, right? We're going to make it to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did. Now, you might not recognize me in heaven. I might have more head, hair. Me and Randy have more hair. <laughs> and I might be taller. But you'll know who I am. And I'll know who you are. Because Christ's curse that he took from me has redeemed my spirit. It's redeeming my soul and one day I will have a redeemed body. Amen? One day. This body is not me. I'm a spirit. I possess a soul, intellect, will, and emotion. And I live in this body. But one day I will have a body where I can be in heaven and earth. Do you remember Jesus' new body? He was in heaven, earth, went through walls. He ate fish. Remember he ate the fish? That's what we're going to be like. That's what we're going to look. Now, what camp are you in today? Are you in the cursed camp? Or are you in the redeemed camp? Do you know, all you have to do to get the curse of life and the consequences off you is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. 
It doesn't mean all our problems go away, but you know what it does mean? He helps us through the problems. He helps us through the problems. And maybe there's someone here today and you've, you've never done that. You've never asked Christ. Uh, you've never put your faith in Jesus in redeeming you from the curse. Well, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we're all sinners. For, um, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. You can't get to heaven by good works. You get to heaven by Christ's good work and your faith in him. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads just for a second as we prepare to transition um, to communion. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and some of the others. Perhaps you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ and surrendered your life and say, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know my life. I have the consequences of a cursed life. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would come into my life and teach me how to live the blessed life. Maybe that's you today. And I'd like to pray for you. If that's you and you'd like me to pray for you, would just raise your hand. If there's anyone here today, I'd hate to, I'm not going to embarrass you. Just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. This is, I want you to repeat this prayer after me, okay? Just repeat this prayer after me. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to repeat it. Becoming a Christian is easy, remember that. But then we start reading the Bible and we start doing what he wants us to do, amen? Let's say this together. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again for my sin. Thank you for taking my curse. Come into my heart. Help me to live for you. Amen. Amen. What's the first thing you should do as a Christian? Start reading the New Testament. Start from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Start going through it. Going to church. And here's the thing about a Christian. There are no lone rangers in heaven. We're called the family of God and we need brothers and sisters. Amen? Now, how many of you know the spiritual Christian church family is not perfect? There's no perfect church. If you find one, run away from it. You'll wreck it. <laughs> There's no perfect physical family. There's no perfect spiritual family. That's why it's the grace of Jesus that brings us together the love of Jesus and the forgiveness. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching from the Word of God. My name is Paul Height. I'm the pastor of Evangelical Christian Church, located at 1325 Watertown Ave in Waterbury, Connecticut. We would love to have you join us and worship Jesus Christ this coming Sunday at 1030. Now may God bless you. And may he continue to cause you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ.